This is lecture 10, Introduction to Integer Programming for IE3340 Operation Research. And in this lecture, we are gonna refer back to when we started the semester and we, we started solving these linear programming models in which we obtained some fractional values. And at that point, uh, the fractional values for the solutions uh, for the decision variables. So we were obtaining, for example, that we needed to purchase, I don't know, 1.2 tables. And at that point, at that point of the semester, we discussed that um, since uh, the problem was assuming that the decision variables couldn't assume any value that were positive, including fractional numbers, uh, that those solutions can be fractional. But in reality, that is not the case. Like if you needed to assign, for example, a worker to, to a job, you cannot, assi you cannot assign half a worker. You have to assign a, an, an integer value, right? So, so the discussion at that point ended um, mentioning that later in the semester, we were going to learn how to uh, solve problems to obtain um, integer solutions. So that's this lecture. Uh, this lecture is the introduction to integer programming instead of linear programming. And the idea is for us to obtain integer solutions for our problems, our models. So the idea is the same. We're gonna formulate, uh, we're gonna state the decision variables. We're gonna state the, the objective function and also the constraints. But now we're gonna force the model to provide solutions that are integer for the decision variables. So here again, we have the, the course objectives and I've been linking throughout the semester those course objectives with the material that we've been covering in class. So up until this point, we have covered every single uh, course objective and the previous lecture was on the transportation problem and the assignment problem. Uh, so today's lecture is on integer uh, programming, which is also linked to multiple of the objectives for this class. Uh, so including solving models for the optimal solution, interpreting the model solutions and inferred solutions to the real world problem. So now we are going to go into that direction in which we are going to state solutions that are practical because those uh, solutions are integer values. And uh, so those solutions that needed to be integer now are going to be integer. So those are practical solutions. Um, and then recognize, analyze, formulate, and solve industrial problems that can be, uh, that can be uh, dealt with linear programming and also integer programming. So the learning objectives for this uh, lecture are to explain how to formulate integer programming models. And number two, to discuss how to solve integer programming models. The agenda for this lecture, we're going to provide an introduction uh, to this topic by using the TVA Airlines example. Then we are going to transition to explain uh, the different types for integer programming models. So integer programming model types. Uh, then we're going to formulate integer programming problems. Uh, we're gonna focus on three specific examples, uh, the capital budgeting allocation problem, the fixed charge problem, and the set covering problem. So this first video is going to focus on those uh, three major bullets. The next video is going to focus on the solution methods, which are listed as the branch and bound method. So let's look at the introduction. As I mentioned, we are going to use uh, an example to illustrate the, the need for integer programming uh, models. So what is the definition of integer programming? 
Integer programming is a mathematical optimization program in which some or all the of the variables are restricted to be integers. Okay, so now we are going to force our decision variables to be integers. That's the major difference when compared to the linear programming models that we've been solving for the majority of the semester. So let's look at this TVA Airlines problem, uh, an example where integrality matters. Integrality in the sense of having integer solutions. So in this example, uh, this uh, airline problem, TBA Airlines is a small regional company that specializes in short flights in small airplanes. The company has been doing well and has decided to expand its operations. So the basic issue phase or facing management is whether to purchase more small, small airplanes to add some new short flights or to move in a different direction to start moving into the national market by purchasing some large airplanes or both, the combination of small and large. So the decisions are uh, listed here, whether we purchase small airplanes or large airplanes. Um, so the question to be answered is how many airplanes of each type should be purchased to maximize their total net annual profit, the annual profit for the company. So here's the data. The company has uh, 100 million available as capital to purchase these um, items. We also have some additional information in terms of the net annual profit per airplane. So a small airplane will uh, have a net annual profit per airplane of 1 million. And a large airplane will have a profit or net annual profit per airplane of 5 million. The purchase cost per airplane is also different. So we have 5 million for the small airplane and 50 million for the large airplane. We have a maximum purchase quantity for small airplanes of two, but for large airplanes, we don't have a capacity limitation. So let's formulate this problem using what we know, linear programming. Um, so our decision variables are going to be two, and I'm gonna use these two letters to illustrate them. So S is the number of small airplanes to purchase, and L is the number of large airplanes to purchase. And our objective function is to maximize the profit. In this case, um, the profit that you make, the net annual profit per airplane. So for a small airplane is 1 million, for large airplanes are, is 5 million per airplane. So we want to maximize that profit. We also have some constraints. Uh, we have the capital available. So the summation of the cost and the number of I, the number of airplanes that you are purchasing per, per type. So five costs you five million per small airplane and 50 per, per large airplane. So the summation of those um, multiplied by the decision variables has to be less than or equal to the budget or the capital budget that you have available. And then we have another constraint that is for the maximum number of small airplanes that you can purchase. So for S, that has to be less than or equal to two. So we also have a, a definition here for the decision variables. So these are not limited to be integer at this point. So they can be positive and they can assume any value that is larger or greater or equal to zero. So if we solve this problem 
using the graphical method for linear programming. We have the number of large airplanes purchased in these ACs and the number of small airplanes purchased in these uh, X ACs. So Y represents the number of large airplanes, S represents the number of small airplanes. If we plot the constraint for the limitation of the number of small airplanes that you can purchase, that's uh, S less than or equal to two. So this is the line representing that constraint. And then we have the constraint for the, the budget capacity, which is right here. So with these two constraints, we can find the feasible region, which is that shaded area. And we know that the optimal solution is going to be there. It's gonna be inside or, or uh, outside but not outside, but on the border of the feasible region. So that's the direction of improvement. So our isoprofit line is going to be perpendicular to that line. And using the isoprofit line, we have identified that this point in which the two constraints intersect, that point is the optimal solution. And as you can see, the optimal solution in this case is two and 1.8, which means that this, is a, this is a fractional solution. And in terms of being practical, it is not useful, right? Because you, you will have to guess how many airplanes you will purchase in terms of large airplanes, because right now it's 1.8. Okay, so that's the solution. Uh, provided by the graphical method using linear programming. Um, so the linear programming formulation, if you remember the divisibility assumption of linear programming, decision variables in the linear programming model are allowed to have any values, including fractional values that satisfy the functional and non-negativity constraints. Variables are not restricted just to, or to just integer values. Since the number of airplanes purchased by TBA must have an integer value, the divisibility assumption is violated. So let's go back to the model. And now we want to formulate this model as a integer programming formulation. So it's no longer a linear programming model. Now it's a, an integer programming formulation. So we have the same decision variables, S and L. The objective function is going to be the same. And actually, the constraints are going to be the same. The only difference now is that we have this additional constraint for the decision variables or additional statement for the decision variables, making them integers. So we will force those decision variables to be integers. Uh, when an integer programming problem has just two decision variables, its optimal solution can be found by applying the graphical method. So as we did for the linear programming models, we started with small problems and we wanted to show how to solve those problems using the graphical method. So graph the feasible region. So these are the steps to apply the graphical method for integer programming models. The first step is to graph the feasible region for the LP relaxation, um, meaning that you are going to graph the feasible region for it's like like uh, you would do for the linear programming model, and then determine the slope of the objective function line meaning that you're going to graph the isoprofit line. And then you're gonna move a straight edge with this slope through the feasible region in the direction of improvement values of the objective function. However, the major difference is that now you're gonna stop at the last instant, the straight edge passes through an integer point that lies within the feasible region. This integer point is the optimal solution. So now instead of going all the way until you find the last 
point that is touched by the by the isoprophic line. Now we are going to look for the last integer point that is touched by the isoprophic line when moving in the improvement direction. So let's look at the graphical method for integer programming. So as we mentioned, we're gonna graph the linear programming relaxation uh, formulation. So this is the linear programming feasible region. So now we are going to apply the um, isoprofit line. So this is the direction of improvement. And if you move and you uh, move the line onto you touch the last integer uh, point that is part of the feasible region, then you will stop here. You will stop in the solution, which is zero and two. And that is the optimal solution for the integer programming model. What this is saying is that you're gonna purchase zero small airplanes and you're gonna purchase two large airplanes for the total profit of two times five, which is an annual profit of 10 million. Uh, so again, why integer programs? The advantages of restricting variables to take on integer values, uh, you obtain solutions that are more realistic. The disadvantages of restricting variables to take on integer values is that they are difficult to model and also these problems are difficult to solve. So the simplex algorithm that we learned for linear programming models is no longer an algorithm that we can use to solve integer programming models. Because if you remember how the algorithm works, we are searching on the uh, extreme points of the feasible region. But as we show uh, already in this lecture, those extreme points are no longer valid when you're looking for uh, integer solutions. Because you might have extreme, or you might have a feasible region with no integer uh, solution on those extreme points. So we have to derive different ways for solving these type of problems or integer programs. And we're gonna talk about those uh, in the next video. So let's talk about integer programming types now. There are uh, multiple types of integer programming models. Uh, the first one is the pure integer programming problems are those where all the decision variables must be integers. Okay, so that's what we call pure integer programming. All decision variables must be integers. There's a second type in which we have mixed integer programming problems. Those only require some of the variables to have integer values, which means that you have a mix uh, as the name states. You have a mix, you can have some decision variables that are, uh, are fractional, that, that can assume fractional values, uh, continuous variables, and you will have a group of variables in the same problem that needs to be uh, integer solutions. So that's what we call mixed integer programming. And then the third type is what we call binary integer programming problems. And those are where all the decision variables restricted to integer values are also further restricted to be binary, meaning that the decision variables have to be integer and also binary. So the solutions are zeros and one. This is very common when you have problems that are, for example, uh, scheduling problems in which you are trying to assign a chip to a worker Assignment problems like we saw on the previous video lecture for the uh, transportation model and so on. So the LP obtained by omitting all integer or zero one constraints on variables is called the linear programming relaxation of the integer programming model. So if you don't force the decision variables to assume um, integer value solutions, then we call that the relaxation of the LP, of the IP, I'm sorry, of the integer programming model. 
So the LP relaxation or the LP obtained by omitting all integer or zero one constraints on variables is called the LP relaxation. If you have an integer programming uh, model with these restrictions for binary and you want to solve the problem as a linear programming, then you relax those uh, restrictions and then you're solving the LP relaxation of the integer program. So formulating integer programming problems, uh, we are going to, in this part of the lecture, we're gonna look at some examples of practical uh, linear integer programming formulations. So we're gonna start with the capital budgeting allocation problem. And in this type of problem, we have a company that is considering investments. So the following six investments. Um, so we have investment one through six, and we have the cash required in thousands and, and the next present value added in thousands also, thousand dollars. The cash available for the investments is $14,000 dollars and the company wants to maximize its net present value. So the question is, what is the optimal strategy? As a note, we have that an investment can be selected or not. And we one cannot select a fraction of an investment. So you have to purchase or not the investment. You cannot purchase a small fraction of the investment. Say no fractional values in terms of the solution. So what are the decision variables? Uh, our decisions are binary in this case, X, XI is gonna be one or zero. One if we invest in the project, zero if we don't. The objective function is to maximize the net present value. So these are the options for uh, investment one where we're gonna make 16,000 and so on. For investment number five, 11,000. For investment number six, we're gonna make 19,000. So what are the constraints? The constraint is just one constraint. Um, and the constraint is looking at the net present value of the investment. So, and you have a certain amount of money available, 14,000. So the summation of those investments um, it's gonna be less than or equal to uh, the, the amount that you have in on hand. So in this solution, uh, we also have decision variables that are binary. So that's the additional constraint uh, for each XI. Uh, example one, which is the capital budgeting allocation problem is uh, typically known as the snack pack snack sack problem. Uh, so why is the problem with the characteristics of the previous problem called the snap sack problem? Because it is an abstraction considering the simple problem of a hiker trying to fill her snack sack to maximum total value. Each item she considers taking with her has a certain value and a certain weight and the overall weight limitation gives the single constraint. So if you look at the comparison of these two, uh, of this um, example, it, that's why we call this problem the snap sack, because you're trying to fill, let's say a bucket, and you want to make sure that the things that you're putting in that bucket is, are going to provide you with the highest benefit. So this problem show, uh, this type of problem is typical it shows in many applications. So some practical applications include the project selection and capital budgeting allocation problems, uh, the store in a warehouse to maximum value given the indivisibility of the goods and space limitations and many others. Uh, the second example is called the fixed chart problem. Uh, in this example, we have the cloth company manufactures three types of clothing uh, shirt shorts and pants. And we have table one with the resource requirements in terms of labor and also in terms of materials. So for example, for shirts, you need three hours of labor and you need four square yards of cloth. 
For pants, we need six hours of labor and four square yards of cloth. In table number two, we have the revenue and cost information. So for the clothing type shirts, uh, shorts and pants, we have the sale price and we have the variable cost. <clears throat> so the variable cost is, is looking at the uh, additional cost of uh, preparing or developing or, or manufacturing each one of these items. So the machinery needed to manufacture each type of clothing must be rented at the following rates. We pay $200 per week for the shirt machinery. Uh, we paid $150 per week for shorts machinery. And we pay $100 per week for the pants machinery. Each week, 150 hours of labor and 160 square yard of cloth are available. So the question is, what is the optimal strategy? How many of each type we produce per week? So in this problem, we have uh, multiple constraints. We have uh, three decision variables for the number of units that are going to be manufactured for shirts, shorts, and pants. Uh, but we have restrictions in terms of the machinery that is available. Uh, also a capacity limitation in terms of labor and also a capacity limitation in terms of the materials, the square yard of cloth. So what are the decision variables? Decision variables are X1, X2, and X3, which are the number of shirts uh, for uh, I equals one, the number of shorts produced for I equals two, and the number of pants produced per week for I equals three. Um, we also have a binary decision variable uh, to basically model if we are producing the product, each one of these products. Why do we need this? We need this to know whether or not we're gonna rent the, the machinery needed to produce those items. So if if shirts are manufactured, or if the problem is, see, is saying we need to manufacture shirts, then this Y1 value is gonna be equal to one. And we're gonna use that decision to tell the model we are renting this machine because the, we are producing these items. Same thing for Y2 and Y3. So if XJ is greater than zero, then that means that you're producing that item and yj is going to be one. However, if fj equals zero, meaning that you're not going to produce that item, then yj is going to be equal to zero. So the objective function is in terms of the weekly profit. So we have the profit that we make by selling those items the variable cost and also the cost of renting the machine. So the cost is, rest, is subtracted from the profit. So we have the cost associated with the variable cost and we also have the cost of renting the machines. So at the end, this is our objective function. We wanna maximize our profit, which is the profit that we are making, uh, the revenue minus the, the cost and minus the, the amount of money that we need to rent the machines per week. So we have a constraint for the labor and we have a constraint for the material. And we are forcing our decision variables to be integer, uh, X1, X2 and X3, because we cannot produce one half of, of a shirt. So we need those to be integer. And we also need these decision variables to be binary. Uh, zero means that the machine is not needed. One is represent that the machine is needed. So the optimal solution for this problem is X1 equals 30, X3 equals 10, and X2 equals zero with Y1, Y2, Y3 equals zero. 
Um, typically, what I would do in class is to ask the students if they believe this solution is, is practical or is consistent with what we want to achieve. Um, and the answer typically is no. The reason why is because we have a solution in which all the y's are equal to zero. And that means that we are not renting any of the machines, which means that we cannot produce. So the problem is telling, telling us that we have production without the machines. So we need to fix this problem formulation. We have to add these constraints that are basically linking our decisions of renting to whether or not we are producing. So this M value represents a very large number. So let's say this is 1000. Um, so if you all end up producing, let's say shirts, 100 shirts, then this constraint has to make sure that Y1 is different than zero uh, in order to be met. Right? If you're producing, then you're forcing Y1 to be one and that's gonna be multiplied by this large number and that constraint is going to be satisfied. However, if we don't have this constraint, then we there's no way for us to link this decision Y1 to the production aspect of the charts in this case. So with those additional constraints, then we have the optimal solution in which we have X3 equals 25 and Y3 equals one, meaning that you're producing only Pants, I think. In this case, let me see. Yes, pants. And the optimal solution for this problem is X3 equals 25, Y3 equals one. So you're renting machine three because you are producing 25 pants. <clears throat> So example two is called the fixed chart problem. Why is a problem with the characteristics of the previous problem called the fixed chart problem? In a fixed chart problem, there is a cost associated with performing an activity at the non-zero level that does not depend on the level of the activity. Uh, for example, fixed charge of renting a chart machines. Some practical applications of this problem includes the facility location problems and also production planning problems. Uh, the last example is what we call the set covering problem. In this type of problem, you are making decisions on where you're gonna locate a specific facility. So in this case, we have six cities in Kerr Road County. The county must determine where to build the fire stations. And in table one, we have the time required to travel between cities. So from city one to city two, it takes 10 minutes. From city one to city four, it takes 30 minutes. From city five to city four, it takes 15 minutes and so on. And then table two has the cities within 15 minutes of a given city. So what this does is it looks at this table and it looks at any time in which uh, the time duration is less than 15 minutes. So in this case, you can cover from city one if, you're, uh, if your uh, limit in terms of time is 15 minutes, you can only cover city one and city two because it takes 10 minutes for you to go from one to two. Uh, if you look at city number two, city number two can cover one, two, and six. Six has a time that is less than 15 minutes. Uh, and one is also less than 15 minutes away. Uh, let's do another one. So for five, you can cover four and you can cover six and also five. So these are 15 minutes or less, four, five, and six. So using this information, we want to look, we decide where to locate the minimum number of fire stations needed to ensure that at least one fire station is within 15 minutes of each city. So the question is how many fire stations should be built and where they should be located. So let's formulate this problem. The decision variables are XI equals one if a fire station is built in city I and zero otherwise. 
The objective function is a minimization of the number of uh, fire stations that we are going to build. And the constraints are focusing on making sure that each city is, is covered. So city one, you can cover city one uh, and also city two, if you place a facility in city one. If you place a facility in city two, then you can cover X1, X2 and X6. If you put a facility in city three, you cover these two. If you put a facility in city four, you cover three, four and five. If you put a facility in five, you cover four, five and six. And if you put a facility in city six, you cover city two, five and six. So this is the formulation. Now a question that I asked the students also when I'm in, in the classroom is, if you look at the structure of the constraints, can you solve this problem? Meaning, can you determine where the, the fire station should be located? If you look at the constraints, basically this is a covering problem. You're trying to cover as many cities with the minimum number of fire stations. Uh, if you look at the constraints, there's two groups of constraints that can be uh, clustered. Uh, for example, these constraints uh, for city three, four, and five. If you put a facility in X4, then you'll be able to satisfy these three constraints. Also, if you look at constraint for city one, two, and six, if you put a facility in X2, then you will be satisfying all of those three constraints. So the answer for this problem is two. You are going to put a facility in X in city two and a facility in city four, making the summation of this objective function equal to two. So the optimal solution for this problem is X2 and X4 equals one, as I mentioned already. So this problem or this type of problem is called the set covering problem, uh, where we are given a set of objects, one, two, up to N, and we also given a set of subset of S. Each subset U has a cost associated with it. The problem is to cover all the members of S at the minimum cost using members of U. Properties of this problem, the problem is a minimization and all constraints are greater or equal to, all the right-hand side coefficients are one, and all other matrix coefficients are zeros or ones. Okay, so we are gonna stop here. In the next video, we're gonna discuss the solution methods for solving integer programs that have more than two decision variables.